In that piece, your listening was first directed inward to appreciate the material nature of sound. The two instruments were playing long tones at slightly different frequencies, which caused beating. In acoustics, a beat is an interference pattern between two slightly different frequencies. This interesting acoustical phenomenon drew you inward to attend to the materiality of sound. Using Pierre Schaeffer's term, you were engaging in reduced listening, which is the type of listening that focuses on appreciating the nature of the sound itself without reference to its external meaning. It's unlikely that you continued practicing reduced listening when the music changed. Instead, your attention shifted outward as you attempted to identify the musical style. This was not straightforward, as the kitsch and naive aspects were suggestive of music, whilst the irregular and irregular time signature and unexpected harmonic shifts were suggestive of progressive rock. In addition to considering matters of musical style, the moment that progressive music entered also triggered a heightened sense of the composition. Your natural response was, I didn't see that coming. I wonder how the piece is going to develop from here. We can call this mode of listening, what is going on in this composition listening. Let's try and unpack your listening experience of that second piece. The first few times you heard that musical idea, you listened outwardly to try and locate the style, but then as it continued to repeat, your attention shifted to what is going on in this composition listening. As that question became answered, it's going to continue repeating, you either stopped paying attention or you found another way to listen. You may have found that the extreme repetition allowed your listening to shift inwards to appreciate the details within the idea that you might have missed the first time. Or perhaps you became attuned to the micro-variations that naturally resulted from the fact that this challenging musical idea could not be played the same way each time. If you've got a critical disposition, you might have regarded these variations as mistakes and engaged in what David Huron calls fault listening looking for the discrepancies and judging the musicians accordingly. Whilst this composition was simple, the listening experience was more complex. The next example considers how external factors shape listening.
You just experienced the struggle to attend to music in a challenging environment listening. One issue was that some of the sounds on the recording had sudden and unusual features which captured your attention, whether you liked it or not. We have evolved to be alert to striking and unexpected sounds because they potentially signal a threat. Whilst our survival skill auditory capacities did not develop for the sake of art, they are engaged by art. The main issue, however, was that the saturated sounds of the recording made it difficult to discern, let alone attend, to the music. Other factors influenced the way that we hear in challenging environments. In 1968, Greenberg and Larkin did a landmark experiment in the field of psychoacoustics, where participants were asked to identify a soft tone amongst a, louding, uh, amongst a loud recording of white noise. We're now going to recreate that experiment. Your goal is to try and hear the saxophone tone amongst the white noise. And we've also added some atonal music on the synthesizer to make the task a little bit harder again. The next example is the same aside from one element. The saxophone is now going to be played prior to the example as well. According to the results of the original experiment, you should find it easier this time to identify the tone because this lead tone is going to direct your listening. In this final version of the experiment, a lead tone will again be played prior to the example. But this time, the lead tone will not be the same pitch as the one heard in the example, but rather it's going to be a, a nearby pitch. This low lead tone should still be helpful in directing your attention to the relevant frequency range. We're now going to return to the piece that you heard earlier with the recording of the construction. Let's imagine that piece was titled Noise Pollution is a Pain in the Ass for Animals and accompanied by the following program note. In a given habitat, non-human animals each carved out their own bandwidth to make sure that they are heard amongst the other animals. Each species evolves to establish its own acoustic territory so that its voice is not masked in an acoustic partitioning process that is both competitive and cooperative. Noise pollution is a pain in the arse for animals is intended as provocation, as activism, illustrating how noise pollution is making communication difficult for animals. Putting the political dimension to one side, this example suggests that information that we receive from titles and program notes influences listening. If this piece had been presented to you with that note and with that title, you would have experienced it differently. Non-textual information also influences our listening, such as the appearance of the performers. Sincere looking performers suggests sincere composition and sincere mode of listening. Intellectual looking performers suggests intellectual composition and an intellectual mode of listening. In the piece with the construction, the recording provided an external distraction, but listeners can also be internally distracted by their own thoughts. David Huron suggests that we use the term tangential listening 
for when those thoughts are indirectly connected to the performance. You were experiencing tangential listening if you were thinking about the musicians' outfits. Huron proposes the term distracted listening for when the listener is paying absolutely no attention to the music and thinking about something entirely unrelated, like where you might go after the concert. Here's that piece again, without the recording of the construction. To experience distracted listening, try not to listen to the music. Try to think about something unrelated. Let's now reconsider your experience of the first piece. I suggested that the acoustic beating drew your attention inward to appreciate the materiality of sound. But then as the progressive music entered, your attention shifted outward to identify the style. And you also engaged in what is going on in this composition listening. But perhaps you had a different experience. For instance, if you're unfamiliar with acoustic beating, and the idea of reduced listening, you may have found it difficult to find a way into the beginning. Given the title of this lecture, you probably understood that it had something to do with listening, but you weren't exactly sure what. If you're familiar with the musical idiom of drone music, you may have compared this opening to other drone music and evaluated whether it was good or not. Or perhaps you were confused at the start but when the melody entered, you retrospectively understood that the opening drone music was an introduction, like the kind you get on some psychedelic rock albums. 
When the melody entered, you didn't experience what's going on in this composition listening. You experienced, I know exactly what's going on in this composition listening. In the opening piece, the entrance of the progressive music was a surprise. In this reprise of that opening piece, you may be wondering if that melody is going to come back. The unlikely has now become likely because musical works set up patterns that shape listening expectations because we expect those patterns to reoccur. As the reprise continues, let's find out what happens and what types of listening the music activates. Thank <laughs> you. 
The final exercise combines four iconic songs from the 1980s that feature the saxophone. These songs have been scrambled together, which will make it difficult for you to identify the songs. The identification mode of listening is engaged by formats such as television game shows and pub quizzes, where contestants try to recognise songs as quickly as possible. We can more precisely call this competitive identification listening. This is a non-aesthetic mode of listening as there's no interest in appreciating the sounding shape or structural features of the work. of popular music from the 1980s is here playing a heightened role and there's an emotional dimension to this with feelings of either frustration or triumph shaping your experience. Some of you will have recognised the iconic melodies from George Michael's Careless Whisper and Glenn Fry's The Heat Is On, but you might have struggled with the other two. 
Australians in the audience may have recognised the saxophone solo from In Excess's Never Tear Us Apart, because that song was played at Michael Hutchinson's funeral. And it's also been employed by Australian sporting teams and even the South Australian Tourist Bureau. The appropriation of the song in these contexts has triggered new sets of associations amongst listeners. But perhaps only fans of the saxophonist Clarence Clemens will have recognised the transcription from his solo of Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run, not least because the hillbilly-styled arrangement was a musical red herring. Considering how music relates to titles and how musical works activate questions such as wondering what's going on in this composition listening, we can characterise each of these as thinking about what we are listening. But other aspects of listening are less cognitive, less concerned with perception, reasoning and evaluation. Listening to music can trigger powerful memories and associations that take hold of us with our subconscious running the show. It can also generate emotional responses and provoke physical reactions, such as the release of muscle tension that results from the resolution of a dissonant harmony. Listening experiences are complex because they activate cognitive, associational, emotional and physical reactions simultaneously. For instance, during Patrick's saxophone solo, you may have evaluated the quality of his solo whilst also had the physical urge to dance. In the, the 1950s style might have also triggered off a general state of nostalgia, perhaps a personal set of memories, personal memories. Sometimes these reactions are even in conflict with one another, such as when we evaluate a musical work negatively, but our body nonetheless feels the positive urge to tap your feet. Likewise, we might feel a cognitive dissonance when we find ourselves enjoying, enjoying a style of music that, in principle, we feel negatively towards. Conscious 
this act of listening, there's also hearing. That's just the ear simply receiving sound. Whilst hearing might be passive and involuntary, music can still powerfully affect us even when we're not paying attention to it. In an article about the relationship between music and shopping, Jonathan Stern suggests that within the context of an upmarket lingerie store, unobtrusive, extremely quiet classical music can confer an aristocratic and refined sensibility upon the products. And upbeat music played in the hallways of shopping malls in the middle of the afternoon can stimulate consumer spending at that sluggish moment in the day.